Today, I'm going to talk with you about the power of talking. There is a tremendous power that you have in your voice that can be used either for good or for bad. I would like to read to you from Khalil Gibran's book, The Prophet. And then a scholar said, Speak of talking. And he answered saying, You talk when you cease to be at peace with your thoughts. And when you can no longer dwell in the solitude of your heart, you live in your lips. And sound is a diversion and a pastime. And in much of your talking, thinking is half murdered. For thought is like a bird of space that in the cage of words may, indeed, unfold its wings, but cannot fly. There are those among you who seek the talkative through fear of being alone. The silence of aloneness reveals to their eyes their naked selves that they would escape. And there are those who talk and without knowledge or forethought reveal a truth which they themselves do not understand. And there are those who have the truth within them, but they tell it not in words. In the bosom of such as these, the spirit dwells in rhythmic silence. When you meet a friend on the roadside or in the marketplace, let the spirit in you move your lips and direct your tongue. Let the voice within your voice speak to the ear of their ear, for their soul will keep the truth of your heart as the taste of the wine is remembered when the color is forgotten and the vessel is no more. Khalil Gibran. An old Chinese proverb says, We have two ears and two eyes, but one tongue, in order that we may see and hear twice as much as we speak. Words are the most powerful agents of the mind. Words are the tools of the mind that create conditions and experiences in your lives. But you are using the power of the spoken word. You're always using this, whether you're aware of it or not, even when you're just silently speaking to yourself. The big question is this, what words am I speaking? And what conditions and experiences are created by my words? Our lives are the result of the words that we speak. The scripture says this, By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Do we have a God that's condemning us? No, absolutely not. We ourselves do the condemning and the judging constantly, every minute, by what we say and by what we believe. One man went to a minister for help. He had many, many health challenges, and in a short while it was quite evident to the minister that the man was excessively negative. The minister invited the man to affirm the next statement 20 times every day. Each day I am healthier and healthier, 20 times a day. Well, the man returned in a week looking and feeling much worse. His complaint this time 
was that he couldn't use the affirmation very well because he kept losing count. The minister said, well, take a string and tie 20 knots on the string. Each time you say a statement, move your fingers down to the next knot so you won't have to count, kind of like rosary beads. The man left pleased. When he came back a third time, he was looking more worse than ever. What are you doing, said the minister. Just what you told me, said the man. Twenty times a day, I say, each day, I'm getting healthier and healthier. Not. <laughs> he was negating every positive statement that he made. When you listen to yourself, I pray that you will hear wonderful things, not frightening things. The problem is a lot of people say and believe very, very negative things about themselves. They are their own worst enemy. They're constantly, constantly talking themselves down. Then they come to a minister for prayer, and the minister prays with them. But the minister can't change a whole lifetime of negative thought about themselves unless they're willing to go the extra mile and change. I'll give you an example. Let's say that every moment of the day, every day of the week, you talked and believed negative things about yourself. And then you came to me and we prayed. It's like if this whole television studio was a huge tub of water. And the water, let's say, was at 70 degrees. And then we pour in one glass of 90 degree water. It's not going to change the temperature of the water that much. Prayer changes you, not God. But in order for prayer to change you, you have to be willing to be changed. Prayer aligns your awareness with God thought, but you have to go the extra mile and change the other thoughts that are negating that prayer inside of you. What are you saying to yourself? What are you speaking aloud to others about yourself? Now, let's suppose that I have a tub of 70-degree water the size of this studio, and I pour in a whole lot of 90-degree water. Pretty soon, all the water is going to be 90 degrees. So the spiritual temperature inside of you will raise God consciousness as you begin through the power of your spoken words, both audibly and silently to yourself, to raise your consciousness. Changing consciousness through prayer involves all levels in your mind. To be born again in mind, a rebirth of your spiritual thought structure inside of yourself, how you think and how you speak must take place. The conscious level of the mind is your field of awareness. You're aware of many things right now. As you're sitting there listening to me, you're also thinking, perhaps, what is for dinner? You're thinking about many other things. This is your awareness right now. We all have multiple thoughts. Some people have said we have an average of seven thoughts every minute at the same time. Then we have a subconscious level of mind. That's everything stored up from the past. It's our memory. Your conscious and your subconscious combine together to make your field of awareness in consciousness. And then there is another level of mind too. That is the superconscious level of mind. That is 
that part in you where spiritual inspiration comes. Let's say that you sit down to write a letter, and you don't know what to say to your friend that you're writing to, and all of a sudden the words just start coming to you, and you're writing the letter as fast as you can. You sit down and you don't know how to do a business venture, but as you get into it, the ideas are given to you. That's God. That's God working in your life in a very, very practical way in your mind. Let me give you another practical example. I want you to imagine that the screen of your computer can be compared to the conscious level of mind. It allows you to display the data on which you're presently working. This data is called up from the memory of the computer, and the memory of the computer is like the subconscious level of your mind. Then you connect your computer to a modem, which might connect to a cloud. That is the part of the computer that allows you to connect with any database anywhere in the world via the internet. This could be compared to the superconscious level of your mind that allows you to tap into the all-knowing mind of God. You are a threefold being. Your spirit, you are also soul, and you're also body. Your body is your soul expressing. The soul includes the conscious and the subconscious minds. Soul makes the body. The body is the outer clothing of the soul. Bodily health is in exact correspondence to the health of your soul. Now, how do you raise the health of your soul? Well, we program our human computer differently. Through the power of the spoken word, we say yes or no to our thoughts. We say no to negative thinking, and we affirm inspirations inside of us saying yes that come from the superconscious level of mind. The result inside of you is an overall elevation of your entire awareness system. Say no. Jesus said this, Let all your words be yes, yes, or no, no. Why did he say that? Let all your words be yes, yes, or no, no. Because he was talking about your God-given power inside of you to take control of your own mind and life. Jesus was giving you the power that has been held secret for ages. He was saying you can say no to what you don't want in your life anymore, and it will get out. It will be evicted from your mind. You have a God-given power to reject unwanted habits and addictions. And you will say yes to what you want, and it will become part of you and part of your life. When we speak, when we decree, we program our inner computer Thoughts held in mind manifest after their kind in body and in our lives. Let me make this practical. Here's a true story. A man in New York always said, no matter what I do, I miss cabs. The cab invariably pulls away just as I arrive. And, of course, he always missed cabs. His daughter watched this all of her life, and now she says, I always 
catch taxis. The cab is sure to come just as I get there. And, of course, she always catches taxis. See, what we say is like a prayer. It goes forth from us to create the life that we are decreeing. Well, are we praying to the great taxi god? No, no, of course not. We are becoming more aware. The man who misses taxis expects to miss taxis. And so he does, and he brings it to pass. Change the word prayer to expectation. What are you expecting? And what are you speaking about what you're expecting. Maybe it's health in your physical body. Maybe your parents had illness and you expect to inherit that illness. Maybe your parents were not the success that they always wanted to be and therefore you believe that you can't be a success. How is your own mind and life programmed? Can you change it? Yes, you can. You can make a dramatic change, and you can start that change this day. No matter who you were yesterday, this is a brand new time in your life, a brand new day. And you make a conscious, spiritual choice through the power of the spoken word to take positive action. Every time you speak, You have a listening audience of a trillion cells in your mind and in your body. Have you ever had an old-fashioned chat with a friend? (laughs) This old-fashioned chat often means getting together with a friend, and it would contain about 500 or 1,000 destructive negative words. The principal topic would be, poor me on the part of your friend, loss and lack, failure, sickness. I've had those old-fashioned chats, and I don't care to have them any longer. Our reply should be, no thank you, I have had enough old-fashioned chats in my life, they're too expensive. I would be glad to come over and have a new-fashioned chat, with you and talk about what we want not what we do not want a person can dare to use his or her words for three purposes to bless to heal and to prosper others and themselves often we leave out ourselves when we're talking about blessing. We can see good for others, but we have to really ponder that good if we deserve it inside of ourselves. There's an old farmer's saying, curses like chickens come home to roost. Most often we're not cursing others. We're cursing ourselves. Are you cursing yourself? If so, they're going to come home. They're going to roost. It's going to be like a boomerang. It's going to go out from you through your words or in your mind as you talk silently. It's just as loud as if you were talking audibly to your mind, it's going out from you and it's going to come back and hit you over the head. In the Bible, it says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. It is a truth about you today. This works And it works in the cathedral of your life, which is the temple of your living body. There are invisible forces, my friend, 
on the other side of the veil. Forces that we can't see, but forces that directly affect you. These forces are the forces of God the good. And they are just waiting for you to call forth these powers through the power of your spoken word. They will not respond unless you call them forth because you have free will. Make yourself a vessel of their creation. Imagine if all your words came to life, that all your words were alive. Well, your words do come alive. Our words are like King Kong and our body and mind are like Fay Ray. The monsters that we are creating with our words are real and they only know how to attack us or when we raise enough spiritually, only know how to help us. Let me close with this story. There was a man, and I knew this man. He was driving in the country late at night when one of his tires went flat. He had a spare tire, but he didn't have a jack. It seemed the only thing to do was to walk back to the nearest farmhouse and borrow a jack. So he got out of his car and he started to walk. On the walk, he was talking to himself, don't we always? It's so late, he said. They're going to be asleep. They won't like a stranger who awakens them. And since they don't know me, why would they trust me with their jack? Maybe they don't even have a jack. Why, out of meanness, I bet they'll probably refuse to let me have a jack. He finally got to the farmhouse. He rang the doorbell. He had talked himself into such a state that when the door was answered, he shouted, Listen, I don't want your silly jack anyway. <laughs> I invite you to give every sentence a test. Would a loving God speak this to me? That's the test. Would a loving God speak what I'm speaking to me, to me? This month, I invite you to join me in forming a Positive Words Club. I encourage you to commit to speaking only positively to others, to yourself, and everyone that you come in contact with in the next month. A profound difference in the way that you feel and the effect that you have on others will start taking place. But the big thing is the profound effect that it will have inside of you that will grow, that will be alive, that will be lasting. I close with this. Luke 21, 15. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversities shall be able to withstand. In other words, you are given a mouth and through the power of connecting with God, you will be given a mouth that speaks with wisdom that none of your adversities can stand up to. You'll be creating a new life. You'll be creating a new you. God bless you.